Is it possible to live in a marriage for several years? Completely unaware of who your spouse really is? And pay for it with your life? The answer is yes. The story of Eugenia Fellini, who lived as a man for over 20 years and married a woman named Annie, is a tragic example of this. Today, Lane Cove Park, located in North Sydney, is a popular recreation area for city dwellers. However, few people know that a crime took place here in the past, the solution of which shocked the whole country. On October 2, 1917, a young couple from Sydney went for a romantic walk along the Lane Cove River. They had a wonderful time and were about to return home when the girl suddenly noticed a shoe sticking out of the bushes. The man carefully pushed the branches apart and saw a small clearing in the middle of which lay the owner of the shoe. The police soon arrived at the scene. Unfortunately, it was impossible to identify the woman. The only noticeable things that could theoretically help establish her identity were her shoes. The fact is that they had an unusual design and had recently been repaired. However, after interviewing almost all Sydney shoe repairmen, the police were unable to establish the name of the shoe owner. Even today, finding a criminal without knowing the victim's name is a very difficult task, let alone the 1910s. The investigation came to a dead end and after a few months the case was shelved and forgotten. On the same day that the body of an unknown woman was found on the riverbank in Lane Cove Park, 15-year-old Harry Burkett returned home from a trip to visit relatives. The boy's stepfather, Harry Crawford, sat his stepson down at the table and said, Your mother fell in love with another man and decided to leave us. She asked not to look for her, because they will most likely go to England. But don't worry. I'll take care of you." The boy missed his mother very much and could not understand why she left without even saying goodbye. He was not surprised that his mother had left his stepfather, because they had been arguing a lot lately and everything was heading for a divorce. But he and Annie had always been very close, which made her sudden disappearance seem suspicious. Therefore, Harry Burkett spent the next few months searching for his mother. He first traveled to all of Annie's friends and relatives in Australia, and then began writing letters to distant relatives in England. However, none of them had heard from the woman, as if she had disappeared into thin air. After three years of fruitless searching, Burkett came to the conclusion that his mother was most likely no longer alive. At the same time, he suddenly remembered how strangely his stepfather had behaved shortly after Annie's disappearance. Harry Crawford, who could neither read nor write, brought in newspapers several times and asked him to read the crime reports. He was especially interested in the murder in Lane Cove Park and whether the police had found the criminal. At that time, the 18-year-old Burkett already lived separately from his stepfather, whom he nevertheless always respected and considered a good father. But the suspicions about what Crawford could have done to his mother turned out to be stronger than this affection. In June 1920, young Burkett went to the police and reported his mother missing. He also spoke about the frequent quarrels between his parents and his stepfather's interest in crime reports. Fortunately, the police had preserved the evidence relating to the murder of the unknown woman found on October 1, 1917. Among them were those very shoes and jewelry. Looking at them, Burkett immediately realized that these were his mother's things. The young man even remembered how his stepfather had repaired the soles of these shoes. A few days later, Harry Crawford was arrested on suspicion of murdering Annie Crawford. But then the events took a completely unexpected turn. The suspect demanded that he be placed in a women's prison while awaiting trial. The man's request sounded absurd, and so he was refused. It was then that Crawford revealed the biggest secret of his life, which was that he was actually a woman and her name was Eugenia Fellini. Eugenia Fellini was born in the Italian city of Livorno in 1875. The family lived quite poorly, and in search of a better life. Two years after the birth of the girl, her parents decided to move to New Zealand, settling in Wellington. There the girl had seven brothers and fourteen sisters, whose upbringing she had to deal with. Her parents did not allow Eugenia to go to school 
and also assigned her the duties of washing and cooking food. The head of the family, who worked as a cab driver, was rarely at home, preferring to love children from a distance. Looking at her father, Eugenia sincerely envied the carefree life of a man who came only to eat, spend the night, and, leaving some money, go on the road again. Perhaps because of this, the girl began to wear men's clothes, speak in a low voice, and behave like a boy in her youth. Her father did not appreciate such behavior of his daughter, and when Eugenia refused to behave like a beautiful woman, he showed the 15-year-old teenage girl the door. Left homeless, Eugenia lived on the street for several months until she was taken in by an elderly childless couple. The girl helped them around the house, and in her free time she went to the racetrack, where she once met a man named Henry Fall. A romance broke out between them, and after a short time the couple got married. But just two weeks later it turned out that Henry already had a wife and two small children. Eugenia immediately left her husband, not forgetting to tell his first wife everything. This incident convinced the girl of the correctness of her judgments about men. So she decided to reincarnate. Eugenia cut her hair short, tightly bandaged her chest with cloth and, taking the name Harry Leo Crawford, got a job as a cabin boy on a transport ship plying between New Zealand and Australia. Harry managed to hide his secret for a long time, more than two years. But one day, in a conversation with the captain, she let slip that her grandmother used to call her Piccolina as a child, which can be translated as little girl. Despite all his efforts, Harry could not dispel the captain's suspicions. A few days later, the man invited the cabin boy to his cabin to sample the wine. It all ended with Crawford confessing everything. Soon, a romantic relationship began between the sailor and the captain, which, of course, could not remain a secret for long. When the team found out the truth, they demanded to remove the cabin boy from the ship, since sailors, as you know, have a belief that a woman on a ship is in trouble. In 1898, Eugenia Fellini was put off the ship at the nearest port, which was located in Newcastle, Australia. Now the woman was in an even more difficult position. Not only did she have almost no money, but she was also pregnant. The world is not without good people. The girl was helped again. This time it was a lady of Italian origin, Mrs. De Angelis, who gave Eugenia food and shelter. Sometime later, a girl was born, who was named Josephine. Eugenia honestly confessed to Angelus that she was going to return to the personality of Harry Crawford again and asked the woman to take care of the girl. Since her children had already grown up, she agreed. I called Mrs. The Angelus' grandmother. When I asked her about what happened to my parents, she said that my mother was Harry Crawford and my father was a long-distance captain. Sometimes, two to three times a year, Harry came to visit me, brought sweets. Josephine later recalled. Harry, meanwhile, moved to Sydney, trying himself in a variety of professions, from a meat cutter to a rubber factory worker. He never stayed anywhere for long and tried not to get close to women, fearing that they would reveal his secret. However, everything changed in 1912, when Harry got a job as a coachman for Sydney entrepreneur Clark Winks. It was at this job that he met the attractive housekeeper of Winks, Annie Burkett, who had lost her husband a few years ago and was left alone with a nine-year-old son. Why don't I deserve happiness? Harry thought and decided to court the widow. It is worth saying that many women considered Harry to be a handsome man and tried to achieve his reciprocity, but he invariably refused such offers, obviously hoping to find true love. In the end, Annie succumbed to Harry's courtship and a few months later agreed to marry him. The wedding ceremony took place on February 19, 1913 at the Methodist Church in Sydney. Soon after the wedding, the couple bought a house in the Drumline area and began to live a quiet family life. As Harry later claimed, they were happy for the first few years, and Annie did not even suspect his secret. I think many people will be interested in this question, how did Harry deceive Annie when it came to bed? 
First, everything happened in complete darkness. Secondly, later, during a search of Crawford's house, the police will find a special product made of rubber. But the idol in the Crawford family was broken in a completely unexpected way. In 1916, they were walking quietly through Sydney when they suddenly met Josephine, who recognized her mother and threw herself into her arms. When Annie found out that her husband had an illegitimate daughter, she threw a scandal, demanding that her husband confess if he had any other secrets. The time has come, Harry thought, and opened his secret to his wife. I thought that when I told her the truth, she would understand me, and everything would be the same. But that was the biggest mistake. She was in such shock that I can't describe it in words, Eugenia Fellini later told the court. Annie spent the next year trying to come to terms with what Eugenia had told her. But no matter how hard she tried to come to terms with it, the harsh truth dawned on her every time, they could no longer be together. After many quarrels and tantrums, Annie told her husband that this could not go on any longer and she wanted a divorce. When Eugenia again tried to persuade her to change her mind, she, probably on emotions, shouted that she would tell the truth to the police and they would arrest her. According to the police, Eugenia could not take such a risk and decided to silence the woman forever. On October 1, 1917, she invited Annie on a picnic to Lane Cove Park in choosing a secluded spot, carried out her terrible plan. Thus Eugenia managed to keep her secret. Remaining in the image of Harry Crawford, she took up the upbringing of her stepson, who, by the way, would become a teacher in the future. Eugenia was sure that she would never fall in love again. But fate decreed otherwise. In 1919 she met 51-year-old Elizabeth Allison and decided to try to start all over again. The wedding soon took place and Elizabeth moved in with her 44-year-old husband. Their marriage, which is said to be very happy, ended with the arrest of Harry Crawford on July 5, 1920, right in the stable where he was then working. Upon learning of such an unexpected turn in the case, Australian journalists enthusiastically picked up the story of Eugenia Fellini. Some called her a monster, others ridiculed her, and still others defended her saying that the woman was a victim of circumstance. When Eugenia Fellini was first brought into the courtroom, she was met by such a large crowd that a crush ensued. Everyone wanted to see with their own eyes the woman man, as the journalists called her, but even more impressive for those present in the courtroom was the appearance of Eugenia in women's clothing. According to a reporter for the Sydney Morning Herald, she looked so ridiculous in it that he immediately realized why the woman had chosen such a style. To everyone's surprise, Harry Crawford, aka Eugenia Fellini, refused to plead guilty to murder, stating, I spent three months in Long Bay Jail. I am close to a nervous breakdown. I am not guilty, your honor. I don't know anything about this crime. I was arrested only on circumstantial evidence. In some ways, Eugenia was right, there was no direct evidence against her. No one saw Fellini near the crime scene. The murder weapon was not found. And she provided an alibi for almost the entire day of October 1, 1917. At the same time, the defendant did not deny that Annie had learned about her secret and intended to tell the truth if they did not get a divorce. But the jury did not agree with Eugenia, unanimously finding her guilty. Three weeks later, the judge sentenced the woman to the death penalty. True. After several appeals, the court changed the sentence to life imprisonment. And a few years later, in 1931, she was completely acquitted on the grounds that there was no reliable evidence against Fellini. Interestingly, Eugenia Fellini was released on one condition, she would have to live as a woman. She had no choice but to agree. Having changed her name to Jean Ford, the 56-year-old Australian settled in Paddington, where she bought a boarding house and became its manager. IT is not known exactly where she got the money to buy the hotel. According to one version, it was compensation from the state for the 11 years she spent in prison. Officials never commented on this information, so it is difficult to understand how true it is. Be that as it may, 
Eugenia lived free for another seven years, until she died in an accident on the highway in 1938. Ironically, she could not be identified for a long time either. The woman's identity was established only by fingerprints, 